First, some information about the song that also influences mixing and production decisions down the road. The song is reflective and emotional. It tells the story of somebody who meets a girl, really likes her and gets close with her rapidly, only to find out she wasn't as honest to him as he thought from the beginning. The foundation is too unstable and unknown for a healthy relationship. He's struggling with the rising sadness, hurt and difficulty of distancing himself again because it feels so good being close to her. But in the end she needs to transform certain patterns first before there can be a solid relationship which is supportive and nourishing for both sides. Why this song works. These themes and topics are reflected in this song. It is rather dark, slow and atmospheric. If you would want my top level analysis of why this song works, it's because the music transports the same message as the lyrics. There is a lot of space in the drums, dreamy keyboards and synthesizer patterns. All of that makes me think of somebody who is exhausted from crying, talking and thinking a lot. The pauses in the music are like taking deep breaths. They are like moments of hesitation, not being sure whether or how to progress. The saxophone expresses the emotional ups and downs, the tenderness and care that he still feels towards her, and also the emotional pain of having to go, and the delicacy of still doing that in a supportive and non-destructive manner. About the project and plugins. Okay, now the deep dive into the project. I have decided to not clean it up 100% before starting this video, because I think it can be educational to see what a real and finished project can look like and how messy it can get. If I deleted all unnecessary tracks and clips to give you a clearer overview of the whole thing, some of my production methods wouldn't be as easily spotable. You will see that the downloadable project file is cleaner as I remove certain tracks and samples. You can find the link to the file in the description. Main reasons behind removing things was to reduce external plugins in the project. Some effects I couldn't recreate with Ableton only, but I will show you which ones and why when we get to these elements. For some tracks I have kept the MIDI track with notes and plugin, but also bounced it down to audio, so you have that in case you don't have access to the plugin. I have also removed recording parts that haven't made it to the final song. I think it's fair to only have access to the recordings everyone agreed on releasing. I used external plugins while producing and have modeled their effects closely with Ableton stock plugins. That's why I sometimes have a higher number of effects and combinations than I would strictly need. Just keep in mind you don't need many effects, but can absolutely use many effects if your machine is powerful enough. Rebuilding some of the external plugins made me realize that I can push Ableton's internal plugins and effects more than I usually do. I think it somehow feels more legit to me to tweak a single external plugin than for example layering three compressors and pushing them hard. Reminder for myself, it doesn't have to feel wrong. What sounds right is right. Keys, main roads, sound and mixing. We will go through the project in general instrument sections. Let's start with the Rhodes as it is the main keyboard sound and has quite some interesting character. The base of the sound is Ableton Suite's electric instrument. I've started with the presets Mark II, III Old Piano, but turned down the belliness by lowering the level of the fork component. Then I've removed resonances in the lower mids at 340Hz and 840Hz, because I was able to hear them distort in my compressor and limiter combination. They make it a lot louder and more compact, although that's hard to judge with a drastic increase in loudness like this. I've turned on soft clipping so there are less artifacts produced when signal is too loud, then I have adjusted the threshold until I saw a gain reduction I was happy with. In the second compressor's case around 5 dBs. Then I've cranked up the makeup gain. Now this is the characteristic effect. The wobbly delay echo builds a dreamy and reflective atmosphere. It is achieved by combining multiple echoes with slightly different modulation and character settings in an audio effect rack. All echoes are set to 156 milliseconds and have a feedback of 32%, which creates that nice subtle echo tail. The decay setting concerns the reverb, which we have turned down. 
For the first echo, we have a modulation setting of just 5.5%. This is very subtle, but it changes the length of the delay times ever so slightly, and differently for the right and left channel because of our phase settings. Listen to how it changes when I play around with the intensity and phase of the modulation to get an idea what it's doing. I went for a square wave instead of a sine so that the delay time changes happen more quickly. This helps as we have two other channels adding modulation and otherwise they might sound weird and out of sync with each other. The wobble is set to 20% to add even more movement. Also notice how having the re-pitch option enabled makes the sound come together better. The second delay has a higher modulation of the delay times and more wobble, but it's turned to mono and panned completely to the left. The filter option would modulate the filter you can set here. It's a nice option to create even more depth and subtle change, but for this it was too much as we have a lot going on already. The third delay has different values again and is pitched completely to the right. When all chains play together, it creates a multitude of slightly different echoes that combine to the characteristic sound. I've included this audio effects rack in the project files, so you can easily add it to your productions as a preset. After that, I push up the lows around 50 Hz a bit by having a high pass filter with Q factor 1.14 and I take out some more resonant frequencies from 170 Hz to 225 Hz. Last step is a simple utility to lower the volume around 4 dBs. On the Rhodes group I remove even more resonances, but those happen because the sound would compete with other elements later on, which is why I added it on the group. Check again what that effect adds in character. Before it's a plain sound without depth, but afterwards it has subtle movement, depth without being washy and a certain sparkle that is lacking before. Writing chord progressions. For a quick explainer on some music theory, check out this other tutorial where I break down the chord choice and emotional functions of the used chords from minutes 30 to 37. In addition to that, I want to point out some extra things here. You'll see that it's not one continuous clip, but multiple clips. That's because my approach of writing new chord progressions is often just playing around while recording and as soon as I have played something that interests me, I stop and add that part to my timeline. Then I play that back and experiment with what could come afterwards. This way I come up with more diverse phrases and melody parts. Things I didn't intend but that happened anyways. I play back the part I've already got, starting to play keys when it's over. And if I like what I play, just hit Command Shift C to capture the MIDI of that. This workflow lets me take care of and put focus on every chord and melody part. I wish I was able to just write incredibly lush chords and improvised melodies on the fly, but until I'm there, this is my process. Generate a bunch of stuff, rely on my taste or preference to select the good stuff, then repeat until I'm done. Quantization. The notes are also barely quantized. They all start organically the way I've recorded them, and I usually only push around single notes or all notes at once to adjust timing or velocity if it's off. It makes the elements more human 
lets the music breathe and makes it much more organic. But it really does make a difference. If you do want to quantize, hit Command Shift O and set it to something like 17%, so you can adjust the right amount progressively by applying that 70% multiple times if needed with Command and U. Adding interest, timing, details, licks, pauses, spread, making chords more interesting. Having only static chords and always changing them on beat 1 of the measure can get boring quickly. So I have a couple of different strategies of breaking that up and adding interest to the chord progression of my keys. Here I play the same chord a second time, but in a shorter, more pronounced way, following with a quick pause to give some space. That space brings out the sparkly echo and gives great contrast before the next chord comes up. The fourth chord is delayed even more, increasing the space and adding an additional interesting timing. Another thing I like to do is adding melody elements to repeating chord sections to make them feel different. Instead of playing the chord a second time, like in the beginning of the pattern, I removed that and added a different melodic lick to create variation. Usually it doesn't take much to achieve that, and even appreciating some of the chord notes can be enough. Also I make sure that I spread out my chord. If I have a triad, I pull the middle voice out and move it up an octave. I find that helps with making it sound more spacey and balanced than having all notes bundled up next to each other. Keys, vocal chops. The next sound I want to talk about is this track of vocal chops. They almost sound like a plucky kind of synthesizer and they are the result of some experimentation I've done. It's some improvised vocals morphed with a vocoder and a Jupiter-like sound. The vocoder I've used is Morphoto from Waves. I put the vocoder on the synth track and route the audio from the vocal track to the sidechain of the vocoder. Then I set the carrier to track and the modulator to sidechain and activate the sidechain with the button that says SC. If I turn up the output of the carrier and modulator, you can hear the signal which gets used. For the Jupiter sound I have used an analog. I've turned off oscillator 2, pitched down oscillator 1 an octave and set filter 1 to a 12 dB per octave low pass filter at 2.8 kHz. This filter applies only to the signal from oscillator 1 and I've set the amount that gets passed on into filter 2 to 0. Then I've turned on the noise plus second amp sections and dulled the color down to 14 kHz and sent it completely to filter 2, which I've changed to a 12 dB per octave low pass filter at 800 Hz, which dulls the noise down even more. For both filters I've turned up the attack a bit to 260 milliseconds to make the beginning a bit softer. I've turned up the decay to 11 seconds to have the sound stay present for the whole duration of my chords. Then I've made this ADSR curve affect the filters by turning up the nth numbers which represent the envelope amounts. In the amplifier sections I've more or less copied the ADSR curves and disabled the velocities effect on my amp envelopes by turning this number here to zero. After that I compress and add some bottom end to the sound before it hits the vocoder and some more makeup gain by another glue compressor. Then I make it wide. First with a flanger where I set the LFO shape to triangle, turn down the amount to 25% and increase its rate to 1.5 kHz. I decrease the flanger's feedback to 0.5 and set it to 25% wet. Then I add an echo with 40 milliseconds delay time and 30% feedback. Wow. 
Other than that, I've only turned up the reverb slightly to 6% and set the reverb type to feedback. This way I get a nice metallic kind of echo which I'm going for here. No modulation, no character. After that comes a utility with 200% width setting to push the sides even more. Check out how these three effects pull the sound out of the center and add some depth. Here is what I made with Ableton only. It's not close. Too harsh, but I just couldn't justify spending more than the two hours I've tried to get it right. It's still an interesting sound though. It has the same effects chain, but uses Ableton's own vocoder with carrier set to external, meaning the vocal track it's on, and audio from set to the Jupiter sound. Play around with it and I'm sure you'll get some interesting and usable sounds. After recording that sound down to an audio track, I've pulled up a new MIDI track with Simpler and dropped the audio clip in there. In slice mode I pushed up fade in and fade out slightly to prevent harsh clicks and just started recording while trying out the chops. Bouncing that down again or duplicating the track, freezing and flattening it, gave me the audio chops here. I add a bit of short reverb, medium reverb and stereo spread through sending it to my return tracks, which I'll show you in detail later on. Drums. The drums are really minimalistic as you can see. The kick drum is a sample I got from a prophet. I've dropped it in, pitched it and just arranged my pattern in the timeline. This way I'm not 100% on grit or always right when I duplicate the sample for the next hit, but that again can give me happy accidents in terms of timing. For shorter and lighter hits I just fade out the sample earlier and reduce its volume. Sometimes I even pitch them a bit differently. I've done the exact same thing for the wood click type snare and the 606 closed hi-hat. The swing is introduced by pushing the hi-hats back slightly on beats 2 and 4 and making them a bit softer. I simply duplicated the first two bar pattern over and deactivated some samples for variation. The same again for the just created 4 bar pattern. Because the pattern is really simple and has lots of space, it helps that the woody snare gets some nice reverb tail and the jazz brushes play continuously and also get sent to a long reverb. I've played the brushes in addictive drums too and bounced them down to audio. On the kick and snare I've added some thickness with this audio effects rack I've modeled after the British Clean preset of the Camel Crusher plugin. You can find a link to it in the description and it's also included in the project file. First comes a saturator where I give a little bit of drive and pronounce the 2.3 kHz region to give it some nice click. Soft clipping is turned on of course. After that comes a drum bus with a slight drive and transients push, which then goes into a glue compressor with soft clipping for some more gain. I carve out around 9 dBs of the 300 to 1 kHz region to make the sound less thumpy. I add more dBs and that's it. The woody rim shot gets some bridge clean as well. I've only pushed up the drive and adjusted the frequency to my liking. For the hi-hat, I push the area from 2 to 3 kHz around 10 dBs and take out harshness at 6.5 kHz. For the reverb on there, I've turned off input processing Increased pre delay to 33 milliseconds. Turned down the size to 1.48. Decay time to a short 420 milliseconds. 
and turned down the level of the diffuse signal and adjusted the dry wet to 32% wet. Just pause the video if you want to copy every single setting or look it up in the project file. Oftentimes some adjustments aren't really crucial, but rather a result of me pushing it around and leaving it at some point. Other tweaks are far more influential on the sound and those are usually what I'm focusing on explaining here. Because then you can get it generally similar and take it to your liking from there. For the chorus I've added a real snare and increased how often the kick and hi-hat play. The snare sound has a reverb on with a 290 milliseconds short decay time and filtering other higher frequencies to get some more middle frequency room sound. Before we move on, let's check all the drums together in the verse and the chorus. In the verse it's nice and airy with lots of space. In the chorus the drums pick up some energy which is a nice contrast and fits great to the function of that part. Reactor keys. In the second part of the verse we stop the airy jazz brushes and introduce a synthesizer which plays an off-grid pattern that comes from recording a synthesizer on solo and just playing around with it. To make the timing fit, I have cut up the audio and pushed around some of the warp markers. Now it pushes and pulls the speed of the song, adding a nice variation and reflecting the emotional nature of the situation, representing the continuously changing thoughts, circling around needed action, represented by forward movement, and emotive reflection, represented by slower movements. Bass, Jupiter. Let's talk about the bass. I modeled the sound from a Jupiter and originally used some external effects to recreate the sound. The sound comes from an instance of analog. Both oscillators are set to a square wave and get sent into filter 1, but the first oscillator is lowered an octave and the second oscillator is detuned slightly by 0.11 to create some thickness in the sound. Filter 1 is closed down to 54 Hz. but set so that the cutoff frequency gets influenced by the position on the keyword that is played. Positive values means higher notes equal higher cutoff frequency. And the filter envelope. I push up the decay time to 15 seconds to give the sound more body so that it doesn't vanish after the attack phase. I increase the release time to 660 milliseconds to make the transition into nothingness smoother once I release a key. But be aware that to be able to hear these settings, I also need to make sure there is sound playing. Now I am looking at the filter section's ADSR, but if the amp section's ADSR is set so that the sound amplification stops as soon as I release a key, then I am not going to hear the effects of the filter's release, for example. That's why I also push up the amp envelope's decay to 15 seconds and the release to 660 milliseconds. With legato mode enabled, the ADSR curve doesn't re-trigger from the beginning when I hold a note and play a new one. This works well with the enabled glide setting. 
In proportional mode, the glide takes more time for larger intervals. I tone it down to 23% to give it just a touch of glide. After that, I want to thicken up the bottom end of the sound. I use a low shell filter at 37Hz and push it up by 10 dBs. But also add a low cut at 31Hz, which gives me some control over the frequencies lower than that. It gives me a nice bump around the 30Hz area that I take to even more extremes with the next EQ where I add a low shelf at 130Hz and push it up 6 dBs. I also take out a fair chunk of 280Hz, some 160Hz, some 650Hz. And for some reason I set a high cut in the first EQ, then add back some highs in the second EQ. This doesn't really make sense other than in the context of rebuilding my chain and disabling those in the second EQ wouldn't really make a drastic difference. So this is one of the things I mean when I say some settings aren't really that important to exactly copy. Afterwards I compress the sound and add some gain. On the bass group, I take out 55 Hz to give space to the kick's most prominent frequency. The sidechain compressor pushes the volume of the bass down every time the kick hits to avoid having those two elements compete for the bottom end space. The second bass track is just the audio recorded, in case I need to free up some CPU power. Take a look at the notes. Again, they are not dead on the grid. There is no need for me to quantize to death, I'd rather adjust single notes until they sit well. Very important to pay attention to is the timing of the kick drum and bass notes. Where both of them play, I always make sure I double check their timing to make sure they hit as one unit. Sometimes I play bass line and like it, but it doesn't work with my drum pattern because the rhythms of kick and bass notes interfere. Where that happens, I either adjust the bass notes or change the kick drum pattern at that moment. And it can be a nice inspiration to use the kick drum pattern as a start and start a bass line rhythm off of that. Or the other way around, paying attention to the timing of the bass line and doubling some of the notes with the kick drum to create a pattern. Another important detail is when do bass notes stop? Let's listen to the chorus. Pay attention to the longer notes of the bass. They often stop when the snare hits. This is something I've learned from a bass player who also happens to be my brother. And he taught me that when the note stops is equally important as when it starts. I found that to be true. Since then, I pay close attention to when the note starts and how long it is, because here you can see that I have some nice variety of short and long notes in the bass. If some of the short notes were just a bit longer, the part would lose its groove. Let me grow with you. Also, there are deliberate breaks in the bass line, so as to give some space and create contrast that increases the bass's emotional impact when it comes back. Keys, Jupiter. I have added a soft organ sound to thicken up the Rhodes pattern. It 
the same clip copied over, removing a melody note here and there, using an analog instrument again. Cutoff frequency to 300 Hz. Second oscillator a square wave pitched up two octaves and detuned slightly. Filter envelope decay push to 1.6 seconds. Release to 1.4 seconds to get a nice and soft curve. Envelope amount lower to 2. All signal of filter 1 gets routed to filter 2, so I turn off amp 1 and turn on amp 2. Filter 2 is a high pass 24 dB per octave set to 105 Hz, because we don't want the very low end information of that sound to muddy up our bass. Envelope amount is zero, so the ADSR curve doesn't affect the cutoff frequency. But in the amp section we turn up the sustain to 1, so that the volume doesn't go down after the initial attack. I turn on vibrato, set the amount to 82%, rate to 5.8 kHz, delay to 1 second, and attack to 3 seconds so that the vibrato fades in slowly when I hold a chord. That way it's more subtle and adds variety by contributing some more movement. The analog gets followed by an EQ with low cut at 144Hz, just to make sure our bass stays clean, then some compression and the flanger effect from earlier to pull it out of the center. This track gets sent to the medium and long reverbs to make it a bit washier and push it back more. Strings. To thicken up the chorus even more, I've added strings in the background. They come from the Contact Session Strings library, but here I've just done the same freeze track flatten routine, so you don't have to have that plugin and I don't have to connect my external hard drive where I keep this library. Things I want to point out here is that it's not an 8 bar clip duplicated, instead it's a full 16 bar clip. This is significant because it adds subtle life to the course, making it less loopy and less predictable. One voice is panned hard left, one hard right. On the group I cut the lows, compress, pull it to the sides with another meta flanger and dial it down to push it more to the background. The whole group gets sent to the short room, medium and long reverbs. Keys, vocal chops 2. In the second verse I add another vocal chop element to get another fresh sound. For that I've put a vocal recording into simpler and added an external effect which is called grain space by Audiority. It takes a piece of the sample and repeats it while also morphing and stretching it in some weird ways. I think I could get a somewhat similar texture effect by playing around with echoes, delays and other Ableton effects, combining different sounds via audio effect rack chains. 
To pull this down out from the center, I have another meta flanger and utility width combination. Add a low cut at 220Hz, take out resonance at 612Hz and 2.2kHz. After that I have an audio effects rack that adds delay. but only filling up the spaces where the chops are not playing. This is achieved through adding a compressor on the wet chain after the echo effect with the desired characteristics. That compressor has the sidechain option enabled and its input set to its own channel, but on pre-effects. What that does is push down the volume of the delay effect while the sound is playing and when it stops the delay fills up the silence. Setting it up this way helps with maintaining clarity as the signal is quite dry while it is playing and the delay doesn't make it washy by layering additional timings and frequencies on top. I make sure the echo is set to 100% wet on the wet chain and that I listen to the musicality and timing of the effect tail coming in by mainly adjusting the compressor's release value but also the threshold, attack and ratio values. sidechain delay extends the sound in a nice and subtle way, the feedback and filters causing it to get thinner and thinner with each echo. After that I wanted to get it out of the center because it should add atmosphere rather than taking up center space. So I've set a low cut at 330Hz and dulled the higher frequencies down by high cutting at 16kHz and taking out 40Bs at 4.6kHz with a high shelf filter. I don't really want the low frequencies with reverb on the sides and less high frequencies makes it appear further in the background. The simple delay after that applies the Haas effect, where we delay one channel by a small amount, here the right one by 50 milliseconds, which makes us perceive the sound to be stereo, because the sound waves apparently come from one side and hit that ear earlier. This can be nice, but usually I don't use it too often because it's not very mono compatible and the element loses clarity and preciseness when played in mono. For the background element that's totally fine for me though. Same here, the delay needs to be 100% wet. The reverb washes it out a bit more with its 1.2 seconds decay and 70% wetness. After that I saturate and compress it to get some additional gain and to get the loud and soft parts of the reverb tail a bit closer together. Mellows Bus The track ends up in the Mellows Bus with some other soft elements like the Rhodes and Reactor Key thing. Summing multiple parts in a bus can be useful to glue different elements together by adding EQ, compression, reverbs, etc. on the bus rather than the individual elements. Also it's great because once I like the volume ratio of some elements in comparison to each other, I can bring up or down that group with just one fader. Of course sounds get perceived differently on different volume levels, but that aside it's rather useful. What I've done here though is using the frequencies of the vocals to carve them out of the mellow elements. For that I have added my Produce My French Morph Cut template, which you can also find in the project files to this video by following the link in the description. I have created this template because I could never quite remember the correct routing, where to put which effect and how to route my tracks properly to achieve what I wanted. I have two tracks. One is the source track, which I want to carve out space for. Here I set the vocal track as audio from input source and monitor to in. 
I set the output of audio 2 to the bus to cut tracks more photo sidechain input. Then I can drag and drop the morph cut rack to the bus I want to cut frequencies from, in this case my mellows bus. The audio routing will update automatically. So in this case I'm sending the vocals into the morph folder as sidechain signal. In the morph folder I activate the sidechain by clicking the SC button, set the modulator to sidechain and the carrier to track. I make sure only the morph output is up. What I have now is a setup where my bus signal gets filtered and played in accordance with the vocals. Where the vocals have low frequency content, the matching low frequency content of my bus goes through. And where the vocals are very bright in frequency, the matching bright frequency content of my bus goes through. If it hurts me, if it kills me, if it just won't let me be, why is this going love? I usually check the setup and routings are correct by pushing up the carrier and modulator faders in Morphoto and listening if the tracks are the ones I wanted to set up. Makes so much sense to me If it hurts me, if it kills me now that I have the frequencies of the Mellows bus matching to the vocal content, I add a utility where I invert the phases of the right and left channels. This means that where previously a sound wave would have its peak, it now has its valley and the other way around. When we layer this inverted signal on top of our regular signal, it will subtract energy from our Mellow bus, but at exactly the frequencies of the vocals and only when the vocals are playing. This is like dynamic EQ on steroids, because it enables me to reduce signal across the frequency spectrum only when it would compete for space with the main element. When the main element doesn't play, I don't have inverted signal on my bus and my bus doesn't get cut at all. I play with the morph cut volume chain as a dry wet, because it can get quite obvious and produce a bad pumping or thinning out the bus too much. I want to use it in a subtle way to support the vocals and track not to draw attention to my production method. But that could also have its interesting applications and experimentation potential though. Make so much sense to me If it hurts me If it kills me If it just won't let me be Why is this going love? Saxophone for the saxophone, I have recorded my dad, who is a very talented, experienced and tasteful player. He is incredible at improvising over a song, even if he doesn't know the chords and has never heard the track before. What we usually do is I control the Ableton session and do the technical things, so that he can fully concentrate on playing. We do it that way, so that the first inspiration can get captured straight away in the moment. Usually hearing a track for the first time has its own magic and inspiration, so I always want to capture that. We record three to four takes of him improvising, getting used to the song structure, chords, etc. and then we are done. Sometimes I ask for things like, okay, now could we do a take focusing on leaving a bit more space and having shorter phrases? Or could you do a take playing very soft and low notes? After capturing these takes, I sit down and listen through the phrases and ideas, marking the ones that really capture me with their expressiveness. Then I add them to a track and look for the proper place for it. It's very much a work in progress that has to happen, so I can arrive at the final arrangement. It's a really nice way of collaborating with somebody, as I get musical material that is custom to my song, but not set in stone and still moldable, because it was quite casually recorded, so there's low attachment to it, staying the way it was played. On the saxophone I take out 7 dBs at 820Hz and 5 dBs at 2.7kHz. <laughs> compress it and add 17 dBs makeup gain. After that come three dynamic EQs that take out frequencies that hurt my ears when they get too loud. It's different for different notes being played, so I don't want to just pull them down with a regular EQ. I have a chain for the dry signal, a chain for the key signal that should trigger the dynamic EQ which is muted, and a chain for reducing that frequency. The high and low cuts define the area that should trigger the dynamic EQ. After the EQ comes a gate, where I have set the sidechain audio from to the chain output, which I have set up to determine the trigger frequency area. 
It's on post effects because I want to use the signal after the EQ has affected it, but before the mixer settings like volume and mute take effect. With the gate's threshold I can determine how high that frequency area needs to be before I reduce it. I use the same mechanism of inverting both phases so that it subtracts energy in this area from the element's sound waves. The volume of the inverted signal determines how much I reduce that frequency once it's above the critical threshold. For the saxophone, I reduce the content from 330 Hz to 500 Hz for its muffledness. from 2 kHz to 3.5 kHz for its harshness. Afterwards I add a little bit more compression and send the track to my room short reverb and long reverb. Vocals. The main vocal is a combination of multiple takes. It is just slightly tuned in some parts with waves tuned to make it sit dead on pitch, which helps sometimes when another element is playing a note that is so close to the vocal that you can hear even smallest discrepancies between the two. In general, I just always go through the entire vocal and correct single notes by hand can be a bit of a lengthy process, but I feel it makes a subtle change to the overall quality and impact of the song. On the vocal track are two dynamic EQs, one taking care of the 800Hz to 3kHz range that starts hurting my ears, Why does this go on? and the 2kHz harshness later at this point. After that a simple EQ, making it a bit brighter overall by pushing up a high shelf at 20 kHz. Why does this go Why does this go That track goes into the Vox bus, where I low cut at 130 Hz, reduce muddiness at 270 Hz and 400 Hz. Why does this go on? Why does this go on? DS the vocal with a compressor reacting to a bell curve filtered signal centering at 15 kHz. That just means that the compressor only gets the harsh sound as triggering input and reacts when that is too loud. But compressing down the volume of the whole vocal. Why does this go on? Why does this go on? Why does this go on? Another glue compressor to push it together and add more gain. The vocal bus gets sent to the medium and long reverbs. I have created and layered different harmonies on top of the main vocal to get more interest and emphasize, for example, the first phrase in the vocal that mentions the track's title, Cold Love. Why is this going on? I came up with these by duplicating the main vocal phrase to another audio track, adding a waves tune on there and also creating a MIDI track. These are the orange tracks and clips you can see. In waves tune I clicked receive MIDI and have set the output of the MIDI track to go to that plugin. This way I can play and tune the vocal in real time and just have some interesting experimentation with it. Why is this going up? Why is this going up? The red track and clips are the results I was happy with, bounced to audio because otherwise I would need to select all and clear selection and check the routing every time I opened up the project again. Then I panned one hard left, one hard right and just played around until I liked the harmonies. For the deep vocal parts I took the main vocal, hit warp, set the warping mode to complex pro and completely turned down the formants to zero. And of course pitched the whole thing down 12 semitones. Why is this going on? Sends return tracks.
My reason for having extra audio tracks that I route my return tracks through is that I wanted to have an easy way of importing return tracks setups into my projects. For example, these are also included in the project files and you can just import them into your existing projects, create and route the corresponding return tracks and you're done. Somehow that seemed easier to me than grouping and saving all effects as an audio effects rack preset. The effects are just what I liked and I have them included in my default session when I open up Ableton and I rarely change them to be honest. First is a very short room type reverb with 400 milliseconds decay time. The highs get filtered and I EQ'd out the lower mids in the center signal by turning EQ8 into mid side mode. I've also filtered out some resonant frequencies around 1 kHz and 4 kHz. Brighten it up by adding a high shelf boost of 7 dBs at 6.3 kHz. and compressed it. The second reverb is a bit longer with 1.2 seconds decay time and here I have dipped down the 1 kHz region broadly by 4 dBs because the vocal would develop quite some unpleasantness in that range. The third reverb is a long one with 4.2 seconds decay time and increased pre-delay time to 114 milliseconds to make it seem even further away from the sound originator. Again removing resonances at 200 Hz, 400 Hz, 1000 Hz and 4 kHz. and adding some makeup gain via the compressor that doesn't really compress at all. The delay I haven't used much, it's still in there because I have so many projects in which I've used this 5 return track structure that I just keep it in to keep it consistent. The spread return track consists of a rack I have built to push out different frequencies to the left and right sides, creating some artificial stereo width that is nonetheless very monocompatible. Of course it's included in the project files and I explain it in my places tutorial if you're interested. You can find it at 1 hour and 1 minute and 5 seconds. There I also talk about the master chain and explain how I can easily check my mix in mono as well as compare mid-side signal to reference tracks. If you haven't tried that yet I'd suggest you really watch that other tutorial. It's one of the things I was really happy with upon finding out. Exporting and finishing up. Then I mark the area of the track with my loop markers, select it and export the track as buff file. Often I also add the BPM count in one of my file names so that I don't have to open up my project in case I need to send it to somebody or need that BPM number. Then of course file, collect all and save to make sure all external samples are copied and contained within my project folder so it's less corruptible by missing or moving files. Access to the project file and final thoughts. If you want access to the project file and effects templates, just click on the link in the description. The money goes directly to me and indicates that making these extreme in-depth tutorials might be something I could give more priority. I've spent 50 plus hours creating the tutorial for this track. Preparing all files, writing and recording the text, screen recording, drawing, editing. I say all that just to show how much effort I've put into it. I hope you've learned a lot, if so I'm always happy to hear about it through a comment. You can also listen to more music from me looking for Le Produit on streaming services. Take care and all the best.